This is the first of three videos that are final exam tutorials for Physics 11. And the idea is that in these uh, pages here, they're kind of grouped in uh, four pages each. And on the first page is some theory. And then the remaining three pages for each section is just some characteristic examples. And back in chapter one, theory for this one, we did take a look at frequency, which talks about how fast periodic motion occurs. And yeah, the equation looks something like this. But we're not just here to memorize equations. We're here to try to figure out what's going on here exactly. Uh, the n in this story is actually the number of cycles that happened. And then this t, this is just some sort of random time that you wait. You never really know how long you're actually going to be watching for. And then when you're all done, you end up calculating the frequency. And then the units for that, we actually name them after somebody. These are hertz or one hertz is one cycle per second. Now there is another little way out. One of the things we saw is that frequency is also the exact reciprocal of period, which we've got right down below. So period talks about how long it takes for one cycle to happen. And in terms of calculating it, you could go little t divided by n, where little t and little n are exactly what they were on the line above. Um, it is the exact reciprocal of frequency. So if you knew frequency, you could just reciprocate it to get the period. And what you're finding here with the period is it's a very special time. It's not like little t, which is just some random time. This is the time for exactly one cycle. And when we're uh, finishing up with that and we're ready to put in some answers there, uh, we're gonna put some units on it. And for units, we just actually go with uh, seconds when we're talking about period, plain old seconds. And chapter two, little review there really quick. Uh, we did talk about our five kinematic variables that we use all the time, VI, VF, DA, and T, otherwise known around Penn High as VIFDAT. And we've co of course got four equations that we can use with those five variables. And we'll try some of those out in a minute. Um, but also just in terms of the theory with graphs for that, if you had a rolling car, and the idea for this column here is that it is rolling at just a nice, steady velocity. Um, if the velocity is constant, then the position time graph, or a displacement time graph, if you wish, is just going to be a nice straight line. The velocity time graph, if this car is going at a steady speed, then it's got one velocity all the time, and it would actually just have one steady straight value to it. And if it is moving at a constant speed and not accelerating, then the acceleration would be down here at zero just all the time. And that's kind of in contrast to a car that might be speeding up. Maybe starting from a stop, light goes green, and then your car accelerates. You'd actually find that your position time graph, or what we just sometimes casually call the displacement time graph at Penn High, it would actually be curved. It could be curved upwards if you're accelerating forwards, or curved down if you're accelerating backwards. And another characteristic of that motion for an accelerating car would be a velocity time graph that actually shows the velocity just growing at a nice uniform rate as time goes by. And for us in physics 11, if the acceleration wasn't going to be zero, it was going to be just steady, just constant at one value. So we would see the acceleration graph look like that for that particular situation. Uh, a little bit more theory. When we were talking about taking a look at, at vectors. We were often doing some boat questions and these little gray bars here, they, they could actually be the beach. And we can talk about our dumb boater trying to get across the river who doesn't plan for the current and our smart boater who actually goes ahead and plans for the current. And again, these gray bars are just going to be the beaches on either side of the river. So if you're measuring here, this is going to be the, the distance across the river. And now we can start talking about our dumb boater and our smart boater. So the dumb boater, that's what this picture here is set up for. They don't plan for the current at all. They're just like, oh yeah, let's get in the boat and try boating straight across the river. So this this vector here that's going straight across, let's throw a number on it. Let's say it's four, right? So this is just the speed of your boat, sometimes called the still water speed. And you know, the, the river's flowing. Maybe it's flowing sideways at three. So this number here is your river. And if you put all of that together, then you can come up with the total for what this boat's actually doing compared to the ground underneath the river. And you can see that this dumb boat is kind of going all off onto the side. They're not actually going to get exactly straight across the river. Now, in contrast to that, you've got the smart boater. 
this boater says, well, wait a minute, I know I'm going to be connecting up these vectors head to tail because that's how you add them. So if they're for sure going to be connected head to tail, and if this one's going to be three, why don't we be smart about where we aim the boats for? That way, when you're done, the total ends up going straight across the river like that. So that's what's different for the smart boater is that they can actually manage to get their boat to go straight across the river. So it's going to work out a lot better for them. And, you know, you can do a, a little bit of Pythagoras if you want to figure out some of these missing things. So over here on the, the dumb boater, we could go and find out what that diagonal is. And it's gonna end up being, for this story here, it's that nice three, four, five triangle. So it ends up being five meters per second. And it's got a bit of an angle to it. You know, you could do some trigonometry if you wanted. If you wanna know exactly how far you're getting pushed off course, then you can do some trig, just some Sokotoa. And I think this one ends up being 37 degrees east of north. So definitely not going straight across the river. Uh, when you go to talk about that, that east of north, of course, you know, we've got our trusty compass, north, east, south, and west. And what we're saying here with this east of north is that it's not really going north, but it's actually been bent a little bit away from north. It's been bent this way towards the east. Not quite enough to get you to east, but trying to head in that direction. For the smart border, you'd have to play around and do Pythagoras backwards, but you could. You could come up with that total velocity here. You know, how fast are you actually making progress across the river? Uh, Pythagoras backwards on that one is going to end up giving you a smaller number than the four. And in this case, you end up with a total, I believe, that's around 2.6 meters per second. So we've actually got a, a boat velocity that's at an angle. So if somebody said, yeah, well, how fast is that four actually going in which way? Well, clearly it's four, but if people want to talk about the boat velocity for this smart boater here, sure, it's four meters per second, but they're actually going at an angle compared to straight across in order to get this smart boater thing to work. They're going 49 degrees on the west side of north in order to get that to work. That's the angle that they have to go. And if you wanted to try to find the time to cross the river, then you'd want to make sure that you actually use the velocity that's pointing that way. So if you're doing any kind of time question, if you're doing the dumb boater, I'd be using the four. But if you're using the smart boater story, I'd be using that total velocity of 2.6 in order to try to find the time to cross the river. And for finding that time, we can always just go with good old distance is equal to velocity times time, right? We can go and do this equals vt. You'd need to know how far it was across the river. You can put that in for your distance and then just make sure you pick the right velocity. So if you're doing the dumb boater question, I'd grab the four. But if you're doing the smart boater question, I would grab the 2.6. And the last little bit of theory, we did do a fourth chapter there where we were focusing on the acceleration of gravity. And so a few different things that we found here. When we're playing around with ramps, one of the things that we will never be telling you because you never need to know it. We're not going to try to trick you at all. Is you don't need to know how long the ramp is sideways. So we're always going to just be talking about the height of the ramp and then the diagonal length of the ramp. And for an item going down a ramp, the acceleration is not equal to 9.8 meters per second squared. It's been diluted down. And we have to go and figure out what that value is. So there's a nice little equation for that in this particular case here where we've got this diagonal length of five and the height of three, the acceleration would be three fifths of the acceleration of gravity. So it's gonna be three fifths of 9.8. And in that case, I think it ends up being 5.88 meters per second squared. So it is definitely not gonna be 9.8 meters per second squared, but it's been diluted down. Uh, next little item that we talked about in this chapter that was kind of specialized, we looked at what happens for projectiles. You know, if a car like this drives off a cliff, then it's going to follow a parabola through the air. At least an upside down one anyways. And this sideways velocity that it leaves the cliff at, that will never change. It's going to be just locked in at one value. You could actually take whatever that Vx is, and you could go and put it into this nice little table we've been using. You could put it here, and you could put it here, because it's always going to be exactly the same value, never going to change. Some other numbers that you can put into this table that we were always using. Vertically, the acceleration is the acceleration of gravity. So you've got negative 9.80. 
and horizontally there's no acceleration at all so horizontally it's really boring we're always just going to go d equals vt but vertically ah, you can use a few different equations there you know vf equals vi plus at or maybe d equals vit plus one half at squared uh, whatever works for you um, but I can promise you that these numbers, the negative 9.8 and the zero for those accelerations, that is always true for every single question that you're ever going to do involving projectiles. And that's pretty much the general theory. So let's just go now for the next three pages and try some of these out. So this chapter one set of questions here. Uh, here's what I would do if I was doing these questions. So I've got a story here about a bouncing diving board that bounces 33 times in 6.6 .6 seconds. So this is this is just kind of some weird random time of the day. I mean, I don't know why they actually went for 6.6 .6 seconds, but that's what they did. Uh, and if somebody's asking me for the period, they want to know how long does it take to do exactly one cycle. Okay, so that's the capital T. And it's this random time that we've waited 6.6 .6 seconds divided by the number of cycles. So we've got our 6.6. .6 divided by 33 cycles so you divide and when you're done don't just stop here like at point 0.2 you've actually got to go and make sure you've got two or three sig figs for all of your answers so I'd go point 0.20 or maybe even point 0.200 and then the units for that would be seconds that's how long it takes to do exactly one cycle about a fifth of a second the board's frequency you got options here you could do the reverse of what we just did you could do the number of cycles, 33, divided by that random time that you waited. Or if you want, you could just take your answer for period and you could flip it upside down. Right? You've already done a lot of the work here. You could go, okay, that's 1 divided by this 0 0.20. And that ends up being 5. But you can't just say 5. right? We've got to say at least 2 sig figs. So how about 5.0? Or maybe even 5.00 hertz. So hertz just means cycles per second. How many times will it bounce in 1.2 minutes? That's an interesting question. Uh, I might go back to this question, this equation here. Frequency is the number of cycles divided by some time that you wait. If you want, you can kind of rearrange that a little bit and say, okay, the number of cycles is going to be frequency multiplied by time. Because, you know, if you just drop the numbers in, you're going to see that you've got five for your frequency. I can be a little casual about my sig figs for a minute. I'm looking for the number of cycles, and now I've got to put that time in. I'm going to put in this 1.2 seconds, this kind of random, or 1.2 minutes, this kind of random time that we want to wait. Now, it does have to be in seconds when I write it down here. So I would have to convert that 1.2 minutes into seconds, maybe multiply by 60, so 72. And then we can solve for n, right, figure out exactly how many it does. I think in this case, it's like 360, right, 360 bounces on the diving board. And... 360 abides by our rules of having either two or three sig figs, so everything's good there. Uh, moving along for chapter two, this question number four. Uh, what's the displacement of a car that has an initial velocity of 12? It accelerates backwards at 1.25 meters per second squared. Does that for eight seconds? This is our classic VIFDAT stuff. So you can go VI, VF, D, A, and T. Looks like the VI is going to be 12. And we're um, going to be trying to see if we can figure out the displacement. We don't know the VF, so I'm just going to stay away from that. But we're after the displacement. The acceleration, they said it was backwards. So I'm going to put in negative 1.25. And then the time is going to be for 8 seconds. Now, this is just rough work, so I can be casual with my sig figs and kind of sort it all out at the end. So I would go to my formula sheet if I needed to, if I can't remember it, and I would try to find the one equation that does not have VF. I'm trying to actually stay away from that. I don't know what it is. I don't really care what it is. And the one equation that lets me do that is D is equal to VIT plus one half AT squared. So that's kind of the plan. Like think about some problem solving technique you can do that avoids the one variable that you don't want to talk about. And you know what? At this point, it's really just plug and play. There's not a lot of physics left. So you could go and throw your numbers in. Looks like we've got a 12 here and an 8. And then 1 half, careful with that negative, 1.25. And then the 8 squared. And so we get a couple of terms here. I think this first one's a 96. And then like a negative 40. So when we're all done, the displacement is 56 meters. Yeah, that abides by our rule of two or three sig figs. 
and I've got the units on there, so things are good. Okay, let's try another one of these fifth dat ones out here. Uh, this next one, trying to find the acceleration of a rocket that starts with a velocity of 80, so there's your VI. It's going to move forward 925, so that's a nice displacement. We've got a time, and we're looking for the acceleration. So yeah, this should be doable. Same kind of plan. We're going to go VI, VF, D, A, and T. So the VI is 80. The VF is actually what we're, we're trying to, in this case, avoid. We don't know what the VF is. We know that the displacement's 925. The acceleration this time is what we're looking for. And the time we know is five seconds. So again, you know, you'd go and try to find a nice problem solving method that lets you avoid the one thing you're trying to avoid, which again, this time happens to be a VF again. So that's going to be this one half AT squared equation. This time though, we're looking for the A. No big deal. We can do that. So the displacement, 925. The VI is 80. We've got a five there. And then one half, and we're looking for the A, and then a five squared. So yeah, it's uh, it's doable. We've got 925 is equal to 400, and then we've got five squared is 25 and half of that, so 12 and a half A. Ah, right, yeah, you got to move the 400. So we're looking at 525. Just make sure you're getting your order of operations right. That's equal to 12 and a half times A. Just take your time. I think this one ends up being 42 meters per second squared. Got two or three sig figs, and I've got my units on there, so everything's good. Now, this next question, question number six, is a little review of graphs for kinematics. Um, we're going to try to draw a car in somewhere on this little position line, and we've got some information about the various graphs. We've got a picture of the graph for displacement and for velocity and for acceleration. And we're gonna see if we can actually go and draw this. So a couple of things that I'm noticing, uh, it looks like this particular car has some sort of positive value for D. You know, I don't, I don't exactly know what the number is right here, but it's definitely in the positives. So I don't know, let's make one up. Let's say that this is at the four meter mark. Okay, right at that one little dot, right at that one little moment in time. So I could go up to my little graph here and say, you know what, I have to go one, two, three. I got to go over here to four. That's where I'm going to go and draw this car. Now, I'm not great at drawing cars, but I'm just going to try to draw one in here. So what do we got? We got some wheels, and I got my car. Don't laugh at my car. It's like a Volkswagen bug. Okay, great. And here are the headlights. Okay, so it's aiming forward, but we'll see which way it's actually going here in a second. So there's a velocity graph. Ah, okay, this one moment that we're actually catching it, looks like that dot's way down here in the negative. So I'm going to make a number up. Let's say minus 3 meters per second. Just making that up out of thin air. So this car has got to be going backwards. So what you could do is you could say, yep, this car is moving this way. That's what that negative value of the velocity graph tells me. It's also what the slope of this displacement graph or position graph tells me too, because the slope on this one is e the slope on the displacement is equal to velocity. So that might even be worth a note here. Okay, so the slope here is equal to velocity. And you've got a negative slope. That's why we've got that negative velocity. We're making it up, calling it negative three. So our car is going backwards. And then the acceleration looks like it's some positive value. Again, I'm going to make this up. Let's say that that's sitting out there at, I don't know, positive two meters per second squared. So this thing's actually accelerating forward, right? We're accelerating this way. I don't know, maybe there's some rockets coming out the back like this. Got some big jet engine shooting flames out the back. So it's actually rolling backwards, but it won't be rolling backwards forever. We're actually firing some rockets to make it accelerate forward. Um, and I can see that because this graph for acceleration is actually up in the positives, so I know it's accelerating forward. A couple of other things I notice, the slope for this velocity graph, it's positive, and the slope of this velocity graph, as always, is the acceleration. So yeah, it's gotta have a positive slope on that V graph in order for the A to be positive.
Uh, by the way, the curvature of the displacement graph is also equal to the acceleration. So we didn't talk about this too much. It's officially called the concavity, but I'm going to be really casual here and just say the flex. So depending on which way this is flexed. So the flex on this graph is actually the acceleration and it's flexed upwards. It's kind of got an upwards bend to it. So that tells me it's definitely got a positive acceleration. Okay, let's try a couple more questions out on the next page. So this one, we're diving into chapter three, doing a little boater question. It says a dumb boater that goes, uh, they're in a boat that goes 12 meters per second. They aim directly north across a 400 meter wide river. And that river's flowing at nine meters per second to the east. And they're asking us how far downstream will it land? Well, let's go and add some vectors together here. So it's a dumb boater. They're gonna take their 12 and just try to aim their 12 like this. But of course they're in the river and the river's flowing to the east at nine. So I've got that in there also. And because of that, that boat is definitely off course. They're going like this. Okay, I'm just gonna call that V for now. It's gonna be some quick speed and it's at an angle. Okay, they're definitely not very smart about this. And I can now go and I can figure out what that angle is. I can figure out what the velocity is for the angle for this terrible boater. I can just use tangent and say, okay, that's gonna be nine twelfths. And I think in this particular case, that ends up being about 37 degrees. So we're 37 degrees away from that nice north path that we were perhaps hoping for. For the actual size of that velocity, well, I can use some Pythagoras. V squared would be 12 squared plus nine squared. Okay, so solving that, it's actually one of those nice Pythagorean triples. It ends up being 15 meters per second. So we could say to people, hey, you know what? This, uh, this velocity here for that boat, it's gonna be 15 meters per second. And it's gonna be at an angle 37 degrees to the side of north, on the east side of north. Now we're not really finished with this question, but we're getting close. They wanna know how far downstream you're gonna land. When I go to do that particular question, I'm going to be focusing on the nine, but to do it well, I need the time. So I'm actually going to go and find the time just by thinking about crossing the river. So I'm going to split my page here a little bit. I'm just going to do a D equals VT. I'm going to take that 400 meters across the river, right, straight across, and I'm going to take the 12, which points straight across, and I'm going to go and throw those numbers in. So I've got a 400 here, I've got a 12, and then the T, and that time ends up being 33 and a third seconds. Okay, I can take that now and steal that and do another D equals VT. Now I can focus on this boat going sideways. So how far to the side? Well, you're going sideways at nine, and you're gonna do that for 33 and a third seconds. So you're gonna actually miss by 300 meters. Okay, number eight, same story about the river, but now a smart boater. So it asks, how much time would it take a smart boater in the same boat to go across the river? Well, the smart boater is not just gonna aim their 12 straight across, they know better. They know if they aim their 12 like this, and if they get the angle perfect, then once you add the river back on, when you put that nine back on, then their combined, their total velocity will be perfectly straight across. It's going to have some value to it that I don't know. It's going to be less than the 12, uh, but I can find that just with a little Pythagoras. It's kind of like Pythagoras backwards, though. So it's going to look like that. Uh, you run through the numbers, and I think it ends up being uh, not a nice number, but 7.93 meters per second. And I didn't really answer their question yet, so I'm going to go do that now. How much time will it take them to cross the river? I can go D equals VT and they're trying to get across this river. I know that the river is gonna be 400 meters across, and I'm gonna grab the velocity that points across, which right now is the V. So I'm gonna go and put in this 7.93, and then look for T. Always going with the velocity that aims across the river if you're gonna use that across the river distance. And so it's gonna take them longer actually to get across, but at least they go to the right spot. It's going to take them 50.4 seconds just to see, solve that one there. 
Okay, so far so good. Let's try the next question out. Oh, switch into the next chapter. Okay, so we're going to do something from chapter four, which is all about gravity. And the question here is how many times will a pendulum, it's 2.8 meters long, swing back and forth in four minutes? Well, we're definitely going to change that four minutes to some seconds. Um, as far as pendulums go, uh, we've got a nice little equation that talks about how long it takes to swing, but be careful. This equation here, 2 pi times the square root of L, the length of the pendulum all over G. Got to be careful about what that thing does for you. It binds capital T. So this is the time for one swing only. Doesn't find the time for a whole bunch of swings, but it finds the time for one. Well, let's try it out and see what we've got for this particular pendulum. We're going to go 2 pi square root of this pendulum, which is 2.8 meters long, all over 9.8. And when I tried that out, I found that this pendulum for every single cycle takes around 3.358 seconds. I'm running a few sig figs down because I'm just kind of getting rolling here. So that many seconds to go back and forth once. Now I want to know how many times I'm going to do it in four minutes. Well, for starters, four minutes, I'm going to have to change that. That's 240 seconds, right? We want to always work in meters, kilograms, and seconds. So yeah, quick little change there. And now is, you know, if you really want to go an equation hunt, I guess what I'm doing is I'm saying, hey, the period is equal to some random time divided by the number of cycles. Very special period. It's exactly 3.358 seconds. And what we're going to do is say, all right, we have got a time where we're going to go for it, which is 240 seconds, and we're trying to solve for n. So I'd probably multiply both sides by n and then divide by the 3.358. You know, halfway along, it might look like this. Just take your time. And so then you divide by the 3.358. It's going to make around 71 and a half swings, right? Not quite 72, but a little more than, than 71. Hey, I got two or three sig figs in the end. Things are looking good. All right, so just a couple more to go on the next page here. Number 10, it's a projectile story. That's why we've got our trusty table there where we break everything up into the vertical and horizontal parts. Uh, what does it ask here? What's the range of a three kilogram blue marble? That's a big blue marble. Rolling horizontally at two and a half meters per second off some desk. All right, I'm just gonna get this drawn out here. I'm assuming the desk is horizontal. And this desk is 0.784 meters tall. And off goes this blue marble. It's going to roll straight off the desk. It's going to do a little parabola. And then go and land on the ground out there. And we're going to see if we can find the range, which, by the way, is just the horizontal displacement, right? So we're after this box right there. Numbers you can always put in, vertically, acceleration, negative, 9.8, and horizontally, nothing. We are told that it goes off the desk sideways at 2.5, so you can go and put those numbers in. 2.5 um, for each, and I've even seen some students do this, just to sort of emphasize that it's locked in. They go like that, and just, yeah, it's always going 2.5, okay, for both the VI and the VF horizontally. Because it goes horizontally off the desk, because of that, I know that I can actually go and put in zero for the vertical initial velocity. The vertical VF, that's how fast it's actually going to be striking the ground going down here. I, it's got a number. I don't know what it is. I'm actually going to stay away from it for a little bit. And instead, I'm going to rely on this drop of 0.784 meters. So in this displacement box, I'm going to put 0.784, but it is down. So I should probably put a little minus sign on that saying, yeah, it falls down 7.84 meters. And this column is now packed full of info, even with the VF missing. I can go and find the time, steal it, take it across, and use it over here horizontally. So that's my plan. I'm going to go and do an equation with nothing but vertical numbers just to see what happens. So vertically, I'm going to go D is equal to VIT plus one half a t squared because I'm just trying to avoid avoid the VF. So throwing the numbers in minus 0.784 is equal to zero multiplied by time. That's nice. That's going to go away. Plus a one half 
negative 9.8, and then the t squared. So that 0 multiplied by t, gone. Don't have to worry about that. So this particular quadratic is actually quite nice for just square rooting. Uh, you're going to end up with 0.784 is equal to negative 4.9 t squared. So divide by the negative 4.9, then take a square root. And when you do that, you find that the time, we're just going to go, go with the plus answer here, it's 0 0.40 seconds. That's how long it's going to take to come down to the ground. It would be the same if you just drop the marble off the desk. So I can go up here and I can put in this 0 0.40 and steal it and take it across and say, yep, that's how long you have to go sideways. And sideways, oh my goodness, it's such a boring story. It's just D equals VT. There's no acceleration. So when you go and throw the numbers in, that sideways D, it's your velocity all day long at two and a half and a time of 0.4. Okay, done pretty quick. Goes one meter, exactly. But make sure you say 1.0, right? Don't say one, say 1.0 or 1.00. Gotta have two or three sig figs. And now the last one. Okay, this last one's uh, kind of above and beyond here. Uh, if you can do this one, you could probably do any projectile question. This is kind of really, to be honest, going right on into the stuff we do in physics 12. We've got this car. It lands three seconds after it leaves the cliff. It leaves the cliff at a 30 degree angle going 24 meters per second. And we're going to try to find two things, the height of the cliff and the range of the car. Uh, whenever you've got an angled launch, what you'll want to do is you're going to want to take that velocity on the angle and break it up into its parts. So this car is going like this at 24. I'm going to take that 24 and I'm going to go and break it up into two components. A component that goes sideways and a component that goes vertically. And we've got a 30 degree angle in here according to the story. I'm going to try to find that velocity in the x direction and the velocity in the y direction right when this thing gets launched. And then we can see how that plays out from there. So I'm just going to do a little trigonometry here. Let's do that in purple. If I wanted this vy, I could go sine of 30 degrees is equal to vy all on top of 24. And when you solve that, you get this vy of 12. I can go up to my table right now and I can put 12 in for the vertical VI. It's going to change, but vertically the VI is going to be 12. Going sideways, down here, go with cosine. Cosine of 30 degrees is going to equal VX all on top of 24. Going and solving that trigonometry, the VX, which will not change, it's going to stay locked in, is 20.784. So I could go up to my table and I could go 20.784, never going to change. And speaking of never changing, there's a couple numbers that never change in these tables. The acceleration vertically is always negative 9.8 and horizontally it's always nothing. Okay, they asked us if we could go and figure out the height of the cliff and if we could figure out the range for this car. We've got a little bit more information we can throw in. They did tell us that this thing is going to be in the air for three seconds, so I can put that in there too. And we're after basically the two displacements. So working vertically, if you wanted to try to find this one, we could go D is equal to VIT plus one half A T squared. Okay, so initially we're going 12. I'm just sticking in the vertical column. You know, just whenever you go to do one of these calculations, stay in one column only. One half, negative 9.8 is the acceleration in this column. And then three, don't forget to square. That's such a common error for getting to square that time in this equation. I'll save you a little time. You run through all the numbers here and you get negative 8.1 meters. Right? That's actually a really important answer for us. I'm just going to throw that in here and now uh, let's go green. So that's your displacement vertically, negative 8.1. That's actually going to be how tall this cliff is because this thing actually goes, it goes up and then down, but it displaces down 8.1 meters. So that must have been how tall back here, how tall the cliff was. 
Okay, the only thing we don't know is how far does this thing actually go? What kind of range can you get? No problem. We'll do the horizontal column. Super boring, to be honest. Just D equals VT. So the distance that you're going to go sideways, you're going sideways all day long at 20.784. We're going to do that for three seconds. Never going to change that velocity. There's just no acceleration sideways. And so that ends up being... There's your...